Hey, 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 it's Penny again, and welcome back to Alive a Day for the month of May. And <laughs> my dear friend, Andre Jacques, would be absolutely mortified that I didn't have everything necessary to do tonight's presentation. You'll have to excuse me a moment. I have a dog banging at the back door. Okay, sorry about that. Let's try this again. Hey, 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 it's Penny. Welcome again to Alive a Day for the month of May. And tonight we are going to be talking about formal table settings. And as I begin to mention, my girlfriend, uh, my girlfriend Andre, would be absolutely aghast at the fact that I don't own a cocktail fork. <laughs> so anyways, um, and you know, when it comes to formal table settings, it is the same as everything we've discussed before. There is utilitarian, which is every day, which is what you get in most of your restaurants. Um, and then, you know, what you have in your home to uh, more formal to formal formal. And today I'm going to present for you um, utilitarian <laughs> so this is the stuff I have in my home and uh, it is laid out in a formal setting and we'll just make it work <laughs> okay so tonight's a vintage cookbook is uh, was originally published in 1901 this particular copy is from 1965 prior to 1965 the last time it was published was 1954 and this one is called the settlement cookbook this one is absolutely a delight because and i wish i could show this to you um i might have to redo this so you guys could read it but this has got the most wonderful reference guide I have ever seen on the inside of a cookbook. So it goes through oven temperatures. A very slow oven is 250. A slow oven is 300. A moderately slow is 325. A moderate is the magic cooking number that my mom cooked basically everything at, which is 350. Moderately hot is 375. A hot oven is 400. Very hot is 450, and extremely hot or broiling is 500. So um, it has standard weights and measures. A dash is eight drops. A teaspoon is 16 drops. Um, and then it breaks down other ingredients like almonds in the shell. A quarter pound is a cup. Um, and then it, it's just amazing. So like one pound of coffee will render you 40 to 50 servings. And just the... Um, the information in this is like milk. I love this milk whole. Um, one cup is a half a cup evaporated milk plus a half a cup of water in case you you know need milk. Um, milk skim, milk sour. Um, sour milk is also buttermilk. Um, and it says that um, three to four tablespoons dry non-fat milk solid plus one cup water will give you skim milk. And skim milk is actually um, 2% or 1%, depending on how you look at things. And then sour milk is one tablespoon lemon juice or vinegar plus milk to make one cup. And sour milk is basically, you know, like I said, buttermilk. They actually have a really, really wonderful product out there, which is dried buttermilk, which is kind of what I keep in my house because nobody drinks buttermilk and I use it for like, what, two recipes a year? So I just have the dried powder and when I need it, scoop it out rehydrate it and boom we are good and i apologize i got something in my nose that was just making me absolutely crazy but tonight tonight so remember we talked about plates and we talked about our cooking utensils and we talked about um you know uh, and tonight we're going to go into glasses and utensils and we're going to talk a little bit about the formal table setting. Now, my girlfriend and I actually had this very interesting conversation because we're comparable in age. And um, we actually talked about how often we have truly had a formal dining experience. Like we're talking linens, we're talking 
three, four different plates. We're talking different utensils, different glasses, and um, things served in courses and that kind of thing. And the two of us said, you know, on the hand, because, you know, most young people nowadays are never exposed to formal dining. Never. Because, you know, it used to be that you would be exposed for the first time to your formal dining when you went to prom. But now people go to Chili's for prom. Chili's is not formal dining. I hate to tell you this, but Chili's is not formal dining. Okay, formal dining is when four servers come and serve your table, all four people at the table, and everybody gets served at the exact same time. That's formal dining. When you have three guys to every two guests making sure that your needs are met instantaneously, when your water goes down ever so slightly and they're bringing you a fresh glass, that is formal dining. When they're serving you in courses, that is formal dining. Um, it's extremely rare nowadays. The very first time I had formal dining, I was like roughly 11 years old. And I was down in Zacatecas, New Mexico, and I was a foreign exchange student. And we were a bunch of middle-class Americans. We had no concept of formal dining. We did not. We were barbarians. I'm sorry. And these Mexicans were like governors, lawyers, councilmen, mayors. We were staying in their houses, and we had no clue. And they sent us down on, you know, we're talking linen tablecloths, linen napkins, silver, china, crystal, you name it, it was, and they were serving us in courses and little bowls and little handles on both sides, and we were barbarians. We had no clue. We're like, how do you eat this stuff? It's not McDonald's. It's not Stouffer's. I don't take off the, you know, aluminum foil, and it didn't come. I don't know how to eat this stuff, and they didn't know how to cut with a knife. They didn't know how to use a soup spoon. It was, and you know, and not like I grew up in a super formal home. I didn't, okay? But at least I had the wherewithal to watch my hosts and see how they did it and follow suit. Because that's the only way you're gonna survive a formal dinner if you've never been to one. But I've known people who have lost jobs because they can't cut their meat correctly. Okay, so, you know, and in a subsequent video, we are going to be cutting meat correctly. Tonight, we're just going to be talking about the silverware. Okay, so for the most part, okay, um, I want to show you an illustration in this wonderful cookbook that shows you what to expect when you see formal dining. Okay, so when you go to a restaurant, for the most part, you get a plate, you get a knife and a spoon and a fork. Okay, but there's a bunch of other knives, spoons, and sporks that have different, um, they, they have different uses, depending on whatever, you know? So, I mean, there's, there's a lot. And then like down here, it shows you how to set up a buffet. There's so many instructions in this book because back then in the 50s, they still pretended like we formally dined. Now, the second time I had formal dinner was at a wedding of one of my girlfriends from college and I was like blown away. I mean, it was the most formal wedding I have ever been to in my whole life. It's a smart girl, married herself a little Jewish boy, old family Los Angeles, oh my God. That was, you know, they got married under a hoopah, you know, for those of you who don't know, it's like a little canopy that, that Jewish people get married under. And um, yeah, yeah, super, super, super formal. So anyway, so the first thing that we're going to talk about is you are going to, I'm going to switch the phone around so you can see this. The very first thing that's going to happen is you are going to set down at a formal table setting and we're going to move the chopsticks because that's for a slightly different conversation. So I'm going to flip you around and I'm going to show you a formal table setting. Okay, so as you can see, we've got a napkin a salad plate, a bread plate, we've got our dinner plate, we've got a dessert knife and fork, water glass, wine glass, we've got our regular knife, a meat knife, we have a soup spoon, we have a salad fork, and a dinner fork. Okay? So, I'm gonna flip you back. I think I have my forks backwards. Let me double check. Because if I remember correctly, the eating etiquette is you go from the outside to the inside. Yeah, I have my meat. I have my forks backwards. Oh, 
Huh, see? But I, re you know, I graduated with a degree in home economics, you know, 30 plus years ago in 1985. So, you know, it's, it's understandable why I'm going to forget something once in a while, especially since, you know, as an adult, I've only formally dined like four times in my whole life. Okay, so any words. So the very first thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna to come to your table setting and you are going to encounter a napkin. So the napkin could be folded in a fancy way. Your um, silverware could be stuck in the napkin. It doesn't really matter. You know, it's like you're gonna get the napkin. So this is the, yes, Andre, we know you know more than I do, especially when it comes to this because you have much more opportunity than me. But like I said, I had to double check. But anyway, so the first thing you're going to get is you're going to get a napkin. So um, you get your napkin, and the very first thing that you do is you open your napkin. Now, if you want to be a barbarian redneck, you do this. Don't do that, all right? So all you're going to do is open it up. You're going to take the corner. You're going to fold the corner, turn it around, and put it on your lap. That's how you handle a formal napkin. The fold helps it stay on your lap properly. Don't do this. That's like total barbarian. You don't want to do that. Don't flip it. Just put it across your lap. Or you can put it on to cross your knee. You can put it however you want to do it. But what you need to do is you need to fold it, fold it, put it on your lap. Okay? So don't leave it to the side. Don't leave it in a crumpled mess. Don't leave it for somebody else. And be cognizant of it. If you stand up and it falls to the floor, pick it up. If you leave, you leave your napkin on your chair, okay? Because what's going to happen is that if you leave it on your table, they're going to think you're done. And they're going to clear your plate. So the bottom line is, if you are still eating, you leave your napkin on your chair. That also signifies that that chair is occupied. So like if you're at a formal wedding and you get up and leave... At least you left somebody a clue that that was your seat, okay? Now, if you come back and some biatch is sitting in your chair and they moved your napkin, then they are not following the rules of etiquette. But remember, most people have no clue what the rules of etiquette are nowadays. That's why we're giving you this humble lecture. But anyways, so, you know, that's what you do with your napkin. Now, when it comes to eating... Okay, the very first thing that you're probably going to be served is a salad or a soup, one of the two, okay? Some courses, depending on the style of the dinner, you may be served both, but at different parts of the meal. Sometimes if it's a traditional French meal, you'll be served the salad towards the end, you might be served the, the soup first, or vice versa, depends on how it goes, okay? So the first thing that's gonna happen is somebody's gonna bring you a meal on the smaller plate. Okay, if they bring you bread, more than likely it will be offered to you. You take the bread, you put it on your bread plate. Okay, so remember we've got the bread plate, got the butter knife, you put the bread on the butter, you put the bread on the bread plate. Okay, so then you go through your course of your meal. And remember, when it comes to eating, you're going to use the outside utensils in. So the first thing you're going to use with your salad is you're going to use the baby fork. You remember that's what your mom said, go get the baby fork? Okay, so there's the big fork. This is your dinner fork. The baby fork is your salad fork, okay? So remember, you're going to eat from the outside in. That's how you do formal, um, formal dinnerware, okay? So here is your soup spoon, okay? Some services have this as the soup spoon, but this is traditionally your soup spoon that has the rounded round barrel okay so this is your soup spoon so if you were served a soup course soup course you would use the round spoon okay but if you are served a salad course salad plate you would use the salad fork okay so you're all done with that course so the server takes that away do you know how the server knows that you're done you put your fork down that's how the server knows you're done if your fork is like this, the server will not touch your plate. If they've been trained properly, God bless if that even happens. But I'm just saying, if you are done, you put your fork down, boom. That is their clue to come take your plate. Okay, so we move on to the next course, which is your dinner course. 
and I am purposely using plates that do not match for the simple reason that if I wanted to use plates that match, I'd have to dig out all of my formal china, which I really don't want to do. So I'm just using my everyday. So this is a dinner plate, and pretend that it's served to you. And on it, you would have a meat course, you would have a vegetable course, and possibly some kind of a grain. So you're probably going to have a rice or a potato or something along those lines. Okay, so you're going to have meat, veggies, and some kind of rice. That is pretty standard fare for whatever you're being served. Okay, so you are going to use your dinner fork. Okay, and then if meat is involved, you're going to use your steak knife to cut your meat or your meat knife. If there is no steak involved and it's a more delicate thing, then you would use, you know, whatever they offer you. But if it cuts, that's all that matters. Okay, so you go through, you have your meal, you enjoy yourself. Oh, and they fill up your water glass. Nice big water glass. And so your water glass is normally this shape. And um, this is actually a goblet, it's a water goblet. They would fill that up with water and they would keep that filled up. The more standard cup that we're used to seeing, um, that's not really formal. Usually goblets are in more formal dining. And you also would have a wine glass. So this is more of a white wine glass. A shape like this is a little bit more for a red, um, a red wine. And a slightly taller version of this is a champagne glass but that's a dessert course and that's later on but for right now you know so and like i said from what i got and depending on the course of the meal you might get something like this which is an aperitif glass no this is not a super super fancy shot glass well technically it is but this is an aperitif glass an aperitif is just an appetite it's, it's a palate cleanser it's something to stimulate you wanting to eat get you drunk to start with but it's usually a liqueur or it's something um delicate so they give it to you in little tiny doses so yeah it's a super fancy shot glass but it's a pear teeth glass okay now you may also be offered a punch and punch glasses are like this and this is a punch glass and you don't have your freaking pinky out okay you hold your pinky underneath it to give it support Having your pinky out is just so, oh my gosh. Okay, so there, no, mm. Okay, hold your punch glass, enjoy your punch, okay? And, you know, so anyways, if they serve iced tea, you will get an iced tea glass. Notice in comparison, the, the length of the iced teaspoon. And the reason for the length of the iced teaspoon is so you can get into the bottom of the glass and stir your sugar and dissipate it. But here on the south, what we do is we actually make a simple syrup and we add that to your iced tea so that when you get it, you do not have the need of stirring the daylights out of it because the sugar is already dissipated into the tea, okay? And also, don't be doing the shit. Nobody needs to hear that shit, no. Don't do that stuff. No, 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 no. All right? If you get an iced tea, let me get an iced tea glass. If you are served iced tea, the proper method is like that. Don't be doing this. Just enough to stir. Gently and slowly. You don't want to be all crazy nuts with your iced tea. Okay, so anyways, so you have completed your meal. So what do you do? What do you do? Pop quiz. What do you do to signify to the server that you are done? You turn your fork down. You also leave any additional soiled utensils on the plate so that we move on to the final course. Now the final course is going to be dessert and whatever they serve you. So if they bring you a little dish that has a little piece of cake on it, or a little piece of pie, or if they bring you, be right back. A little 
ramekin filled with a divine creme brulee with its shiny, crackly, yummy, sugary top. Okay, then you have your dessert course. And then you start out with your dessert fork or your dessert spoon, depending on how you feel about it. Or if um, you, and usually at this point, they bring you coffee. And so um, coffee will be presented to you in a coffee mug, usually on a saucer. And then you can use this to stir your cream and sugar if you like. And they'll either offer you individual creams and sugars or they will offer you um, communal cream and sugar, depending on where you're eating or what they're doing. But now with COVID, everything's individualized. So I'm sure they're going to bring you individual um, containers. And if it's the kind with the pullet, you're not formally dining. <laughs> so anyway, so that's a quick and dirty of the wonderful world of formal dining. Oh, another dessert option. If they don't bring you a ramekin, they might bring you a sundae. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good old Sunday cup. So, and, um, you know, they would present that to you. Sunday. You know, that's a mighty fine $5 milkshake. Yeah. So, anyway, it's a Sunday. So, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many other formal parts of the dining experience that you might be exposed to but these are the bare minima now if you don't know what to do remember outside in is how you eat so whatever is presented on the outside is going to go along with the courses that you're served and you go outside in okay and then top to bottom so anyway so that's how you survive a formal dinner if you've ever exposed to one next week we'll be showing you how to cut up meat so you don't get fired from your job by looking like a complete barbarian okay we don't want you to look like a barbarian we want you to have manners we want you to be a presentable human being we want you to answer the phone and be able to have a conversation with the person on the other end and not sound like you are void of language we want you to look good. That's why Penny is teaching you the basics of home economics in this whole month of May live a days. I'm trying to teach you how you can survive in a kitchen without your mom, okay? So just think of me as, as Mommy Penny trying to teach you how to be successful. And considering my age, Grandma Penny, okay? I'm totally cool with that. I have no grandkids and I'm in no rush to have any, by the way. But, you know, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, if you want to call me grandma, I'll totally take it. My sister, she got eight grandkids, okay? She got eight, and that's okay for her. Yeah, okay. But anyways, this is mommy's goal for you. Mommy Penny wants you to be successful. She doesn't want you to look like a barbarian, okay? She doesn't want you to use your salad fork for your meat. That's all she wants. All she wants is for you to like not bang a glass. When you're at a when you're at a nothing is more barbarian and insulting to see somebody go like this. At a wedding. Oh my god. You don't even know how much that that completely freaks me out because that's so wrong, that is so wrong. If you wanna get somebody's attention, you know what you do? You speak from your diaphragm and you use your inside big voice. Ladies and gentlemen, may I please have your attention? You don't have to go banging a frigging glass. Oh my God. Oh, that's so barbarian. Oh, so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, 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 get, I get a bit fluttered when I have to talk about barbarians. Cause, but okay, so this is my, my, uh, my next formal dining story and I'm gonna tell you how, how this came about. So my father was, for lack of a better term, a bit of a redneck. <laughs> and he came from the wilds of Wyoming and when he was a kid, his job was to herd dudes. So people would come from Oklahoma City and Kansas City and they would come to Yellowstone National Park and my dad would do trail boss stuff with him as he was you know and that was his kit his job until he moved out to California and um, spent his senior year of high school 
at my cousin's house in Hollywood, at my, at my auntie's house in Hollywood before he joined um, the cavalry before during World War II. And that's a whole other story. But anyways, so my dad, when he lived in Hollywood, he would, there was this time in Hollywood in the 40s and where people were beginning to move away from the formal, okay? And at this era, there was this kind of like, um, there was still a formalness to it, but the Shakespeareans were very thespian and, and there was this free thought and this Paris shit and everybody. And so my dad kind of hung out with the, the periphery of Hollywood society because he lived right next to Paramount Studios. And for the life of me, I only, always thought my whole life the man was bullshitting because my dad was a big fish guy, totally a big fish. Then one day we went down to Coenga and we're heading down Hollywood Boulevard and he goes, turn left. And I'm like, okay, you wanna turn left, you know? And the next thing I know, we're at the back lot of Paramount. And I'm like, dad, what are you doing? He goes, oh yeah, I used to live right around the corner. Come on, let me show you where I live. And he has me drive by this apartment complex he lived with with his sister during World War II. So his story is that he's in Hollywood High School and he's, you know, it's, it's 40, 44, 40, 42, 43, somewhere around there. And um, he was born in 25, you do the math, whatever, 17 years old is. And he's going to Hollywood High School and all he has is farm clothes. So all he has is dungarees and t-shirts because he was a farmhand and he's got this flaming red hair, these bright, bright blue eyes, and he goes to Hollywood High School and everybody's wearing Oxfords and khakis and loafers. And there's my dad in his boots and his jeans and his t-shirts. And he said, you know, I show up to Hollywood High School and the next thing I know, Marlon Brando and James Dean are wearing jeans and t-shirts. So my dad swears that it was his arrival into Hollywood that brought up the rebel aesthetic. My dad was the original greaser. That's what he says. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. But anyways, so in hanging out with the Hollywood sub-elite, I suppose, he was exposed to things that were a little more formal than his barbarian life back wrangling cattle. So, one time his sisters come to visit. Now remember, my dad was working in aerospace. He was working for Aerojet. He was, he was an executive in this company and they were working on, you know, getting men on the moon and all this other stuff. And his sisters come to visit and it dawned on me for the very first time, my dad was a little bit of a redneck, just a little bit, you know. And his sisters, there was a pecking order. And it's weird because as a child, when you first see your parents in a pecking order of their siblings, you're like, ooh, you know? And it dawns on you and it, and because you're not exposed to that. You only know your dad as your dad. You never imagine your dad as a little brother. You don't think about that kind of thing. And so my dad is sitting there and his sisters have left from their visit. And he goes, you know, it would have been nice if we could have served them in some kind of a manner. I mean, what's the point of having China if you don't eat off of it or have the taste of silver in your mouth? And he was bitching. And at this point, you know, it's 82, 83, something like that. And I'm in the middle of getting my degree in home economics. And I'm like, I'm friggin' getting a degree in formal dining. And you're telling me that I'm a barbarian. Ooh, I did not take kindly to this. And so, you know me, I was up for a challenge. Oh, hell yeah. So, we got out my mom's china. We got out my mom's silver. I ended up purchasing the crystal because we did not own the crystal. So I ended up purchasing the crystal and everything that we needed to do a formal dining, dinner for a, a family of eight. We ended up doing a French style and I wrote the menu and my brother and sister-in-law were 
under the job of kidnapping my father and getting him the hell out of the house for a few hours. So they went and took him to the movies and then they took him out to get like ice cream or something. I don't know. But they got him out of the house for a couple minutes and then they gave us a call and said he's on his way. So by then, we had the table set up with linens, we had crystals, we had the meal ready, and we were getting ready to serve. The appetizer was puff pastry with um, cream cheese and caviar. And for those who weren't gonna like the caviar, I had mock caviar, which is basically chopped olives. So we ended up having this, you know, this very, very formal, formal, formal dinner with individual plates, silver, crystal, the whole nine yards, wine courses, everything. My dad had nothing negative to say. He completely freaked out. He did not know what to expect. And then, unfortunately, he ruined it because the following year, I tried to do it again, but he started to try and guess what I was going to be preparing. And then I decided, you know what? I'm not doing this again. I've proven my point that I'm not a barbarian, that I have gotten a degree in how not to be a barbarian. And you just have to accept the fact that I know how not to be a barbarian. And your family also knows how not to be a barbarian. And if it bothers you that your family is very casual and informal, and I apologize for that. But that's not my problem. That's your problem. So anyways, that was the last time. No, no, no. I take it back. Andre remembers the last time I had formal dining. That was at the Commander's Palace in New Orleans for my uh, 50th birthday. Yeah. Now that was formal dining. Anytime you have got a waitress that's got a little brush in her pocket to sweep up crumbs. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was some formal dining, and those were some damn good martinis, too. But anyways, so that's my story, how to not look stupid when presented with formal dining. And I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll be uploading it to YouTube. And uh, so that's it for tonight. And don't forget, I love you, and I want you to be successful. Yes, and not look like a barbarian, because if you look like a barbarian, then I have failed. All right, and I don't like to fail. No. I want you to be successful. And that's why I'm doing these. So don't forget, I love you. And we'll talk to you tomorrow night. All right, bye-bye.